The Buddha's meditation instructions come in four sets of four, called four tetrads, 16 steps in all. And when people are just getting started, it, they tend to ignore the last set because they figure that's for advanced practitioners. But actually each tetrad takes place simultaneously. In other words, the tetrad dealing with the body and with the feelings and with mind states. It's not the case that you first work with the body and then when that's all taken care of you work with feelings and then when they're taken care of you work with mind states. You've got to deal with all three from the very beginning. You're sitting here breathing and a pain comes up in the body. You've got to deal with the pain. Or a distraction comes up in the mind. You've got to deal with the distraction. And that fourth tetrad is also there. It basically gives you instructions on how you deal with obstructions. The four sets are this. You breathe in and out, paying attention to inconstancy. You breathe in and out, paying attention to dispassion. You breathe in and out, paying attention to cessation. And then breathing out, paying attention to relinquishment. Now, you can interpret those as applying to a very advanced level of the practice, and they do. But it's also useful to apply them as you're just getting started. You run into an obstacle like a pain in the body. Remember, the pain is inconstant. It's not there all the time. It comes and goes. And if you find that the pain is blocking your breath, you have to ask yourself, what am I doing that's making it block? What image do I have in mind that's getting in the way of the breath flowing smoothly there? You have to see that image as inconstant. Maybe it's not really true. Hold another image in mind. Remember breath can go through anything. The atoms in your leg, the ones that you say are pained, are mostly space. So think of the breath going through that space. At the very least, if it doesn't make the pain go away, it releases a lot of the tension around the pain. It makes it a lot easier to set in, because as the Buddha says in those instructions for feelings, you try to breathe in a way that gives rise to rapture, and you try to breathe in a way that gives rise to pleasure. And so if the pains are getting in the way of the rapture and pleasure, you've got to do something with them. And this is one of the ways of dealing with them, seeing that they're not really as solid or as impenetrable or as lasting as you might think, even if you have a chronic pain. It comes and goes. And don't think of it as a wall. Think of it as this porous kind of thing. So focusing on the inconstancy of the pain there, and the inconstancy of the image that's getting in the way, that's making the pain worse than it has to be, more of an obstruction than it has to be. That allows you to develop some dispassion for your old ways of seeing things. This is really useful in the meditation, because we tend to bring our preconceptions in the meditation, saying this is possible, that's impossible, like when we talk about breath energy flowing in the body. And until you develop some dispassion for your old ways of perceiving the body that would get in the way of sensing the breath flow, you're putting a major obstacle in your path. The same with obstructive mind states. Hindrance comes up. In the section on dealing with the mind, the Buddha says you try to gladden the mind, steady the mind, and release the mind. So in gladdening the mind, what kind of obstruction is getting in the way? Are you feeling glad about the fact you're here? Is doubt getting in the way? Is restlessness and anxiety getting in the way? Is sleepiness getting in the way? Okay, what do you do to counteract these things? First you have to see these things as impermanent, that they are inconstant. Like with sleepiness, all too often when the symptoms of drowsiness come over, we say, oh, that's it, time to stop. And you have to ask yourself, are they really signs that you're drowsy, or is this the mind's way of playing tricks on itself? So try to find a spot in the body that's not being affected by the signs of drowsiness. And then look at those signs. You see that they come and they go. They might be a going around the eyes, all the little fog going through your brain. And if you're the kind of person who likes to sleep a lot, you've learned how to maximize those sensations to make them more powerful than they really are. So you have to step back and say, okay, just look at this, because this is a lot of what the, 
that fourth tetrad is, just looking at things for a while. And then seeing that they're not as powerful or as constant or as overwhelming as you might have thought. The sun signs of drowsiness come and go, and so when they're gone, okay, make the most of that fact. Same with restlessness and anxiety, the thoughts that pull you away from the present moment, telling you've got to think about something else. Well, they too are inconstant. How reliable are they? You might tell yourself, well, I've got a plan for this, I've got to worry about that, and I've got to make arrangements so that this doesn't happen or that doesn't happen. And you have to remind yourself, you don't really know what's going to happen in the future. It's very unpredictable. What you do know is that you're going to need lots of mindfulness, lots of alertness, lots of concentration, lots of discernment. And where you're going to get those qualities? By developing the mind right now. So take care of any eventuality up in the future. You work out in the meditation. That's your best way of preparing for the future. This allows you to develop some dispassion for those restless thoughts, thoughts of anxiety. And when you're not feeling any passion for them, that's, that's when they cease, and you can let them go. So when you find that there's an obstruction in your meditation, either dealing with feelings or with mind states, keep these steps in mind. First, look for the fact that no matter how insistent or powerful or convincing the mind state, it is inconstant. The same with a feeling. A pain may have been there for a long time, but it doesn't have to be there always. And even if it is a long-lasting pain, you can learn to look at it as inconstant, coming and going, little moments of pain. An image I found useful is you're sitting in the back, say, of a bus, facing backwards. And as you go down the street, things that come into the range of your vision come in from the side, and then they go away. The opposite when you're sitting in the front, and things coming into your range of vision seem to be coming right at you. Well, think of the pain, those moments of pain, as coming into your range of vision as they're going away, rather than as coming at you. That changes your relationship to them, and you begin to see them as a lot less lasting. They come and they're gone. They come and they're gone. And so you can breathe around them. You can make your awareness go around them. You don't have to focus so intently on them, because a lot of the times that's our problem, is we focus on these things so intently that we strengthen them, we solidify them. And that makes the obstacles greater than they have to be. To see them as little bits and pieces, moments. Same with the pain, the same say with anger. Anger seems to be sometimes very long and lasting. But it has its moment, and it goes. And then we dig it up again, and it goes again. And we dig it up again, and it goes again. And the problem is not the, the moment of anger, it's the digging it up again. Well, who's doing that? Well, we're the ones doing that. We have a passion for digging up our anger. Same as we have a passion for digging up lust, digging up greed, whatever our, our standard problems are. And so once there's a moment of anger, you don't have to say, oh, here it is, it's coming, and then latch on to it. You want to see it, oh, here it's coming, it's going to go. I don't have to get caught up in it. So if you can see these things as not as solid as they seem to be, not as powerful as they seem to be, that puts you in a better position to develop some dispassion for them. And the passion is actually the problem. Once you can develop the dispassion, then these things cease. You let them go and you move on. Now, while you're working on your concentration, you don't want to look at that yet as inconstant. In fact, as a John Lee would recommend, you try to develop concentration in spite of the perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not self. In other words, you're trying to make this state of mind as constant as possible as easeful as possible and as much under your control as possible. That puts you in a better position to fight off a lot of these obstacles. So the concentration and the ability to fight these things off go together. In other words, you have to fight them off to get the mind concentrated, and the more stronger your concentration, the more constant it becomes, and it's easier to see the inconstancy of other things. You've got a point of comparison. You see the pleasure that it offers, and you compare that to the pleasure that these other things, these other feelings and mind states seem to offer, and you realize that it's not that much. 
what they offer. What you've got here with the concentration is a lot more reliable. The sense of well-being goes a lot deeper. So again, you've got a point of comparison. And when it's under your control, then you can see how little control you have over these other things, and you realize that they're not worth it at all, not worth getting involved with. You can let them go. It's only at the very end of the practice that you turn this set of this last tetrad on to the concentration itself, seeing that it too has its inconstancy. And as you've developed a passion for it, and you really do have to develop a passion for the concentration. I was reading a book recently where someone was saying that you don't have to analyze jhana because nobody's really stuck on jhana. But this particular person was teaching kind of a five, ten minute jhana, and there's nothing much there. So there's nothing much there to get stuck on. But if you're using the concentration as your tool for peeling away other things and you've gotten to learn to rely on it, and if you don't rely on it, you're not going to be able to peel these things away. You've got to get attached to the concentration to let these other things go. But at that point, now the concentration itself becomes your main attachment. Then you reach that point, then you can start turning the analysis of inconstancy onto this. You see that even this, how much, how much you've liked it, no matter how much you've learned to depend on it, it's time to let it go. You develop some dispassion work because you see that it too has stress. It too is not totally under your control. If you're trying to find a really reliable happiness, you can't stay here. But everywhere else you move on. You realize okay, that would just be another state of concentration. So what do you do? You can't stay and you can't move. Well, there's another alternative. And if you're really perceptive, you'll see there is that alternative, and you let both the staying and the moving go away. That's when you let go of everything. Everything gets relinquished as they cease and fall away. That's the kind of insight we're ultimately aiming at. And you get there by learning how to use these tools from very early on. Even as you're just settling down with the breath, okay, is there a pain in the way of getting the breath smoothly through the body? Okay, learn to see it as inconstant and see what perceptions you're holding on to that are maintaining that pain, strengthening the pain, learn to let them go. And then you realize it's what's left does not provide an obstacle to the breath and allows the breath to fl flow smoothly through the body. So you do get a sense of rapture. You tune out of the pain and into the rapture. Same with any other mind state that comes up, things that are more depressing, things that are more disturbing. See, they're just coming and going, and you've got something here that you can see as underlying them, as more lasting, the sense of the breath staying there all the time. That's actually a lot more solid than the coming and going of the thought. That allows you to let it go as it falls away, as it will fall away. It allows you to let it go so you're not digging it up again. So this last tetrad is useful all the way along the practice. So keep in mind, as you're sitting here, it's a very useful tool from the very beginning to the very end.